I was texting with a girl I was interested in. We'd hung out on my place playing pool and darts a few times, but we had yet to go on our first official date. During the course of our text conversation, I brought up my love for the outdoors and camping. She said she loved that stuff too. Let's go. This made me happy. I asked her when she wanted to do it. She said, right now, silly. Camping is something that you typically plan for, at least a little bit. But I had all the equipment, a fridge full of beer and some food to throw over a fire. I know of more spots than the average SoCal resident, and it's only 8 o'clock, so I enthusiastically said, let's do it. I love impulsive adventures, but still, what a strange girl. She was hanging out with her friend I had never met, and I was hanging out with my boss from the country club bar I attended at, and both our friends agreed it would be fun, but maybe with less enthusiasm than me and F had about it. Due to the no-name rule, I'll be using initials for the entirety of this post. Instead of picking them up, they decided they wanted us to drive over. Then they would be waiting in the car and would follow us to the campsite. I found out later that F's friend K wanted a quick out if she wasn't feeling it. Me and my buddy E get to their house and they're already waiting in a car for us. Off we go to my favourite spot and they're following close behind. An hour and a half later we get to my favourite camp and it's closed. Oh no. I took us to one way out of the way and I don't know any others in this area. I decided to just wing it and drive north. Surely we'll find something. We end up passing a small camp called Lake Pyru. I think it was Pyru, it's been a while. But if it wasn't Pyru, then it was something in that area. We pull into a modest, a mostly empty camp, and I find a great spot well removed from all of the other sites. It's surrounded 200 degrees by a wall of thick and tall oaks. We all get out of our vehicles, and I see F for the first time that night. She had on full makeup, knee-high boots, and a small dress. What a strange girl. I burst out in laughter. I couldn't help myself. Almost in tears laughing, I ask her, What are you wearing? You know I said camping, right? Do you have some things to change into? With no shame, she looked me right in the eye and said she wanted to look good for me. And yes, she has a change of clothes, but she's quite happy at the moment. She assured me she was quite competent at all things outdoors and that she knows what she's doing. I didn't believe this for a moment. Over the years, she proved me wrong, showing herself to be accomplished at climbing and ca canyoneering, knew more knots than me and could swing an axe like a lumberjack. But at the time, I was secretly thinking this had to be her first time in the woods. What a strange girl. Our friends didn't hit it off, not even a little. About an hour into hanging out, Kay retired to the tent. I, I gave her to share with my buddy, and my buddy decided to go sleep in the car. So it's just me and F hanging out, having a great time. She's still in club clothes, and we decided to go on a little night hike. We come to this little clearing in the woods, and are staring up at the beautiful stars in the night sky. We hear a snap off in the bush about 20 feet away. F gives me a worried look, and says we need to go back. I try not to mock her when I tell her that the woods have animals. There's literally nothing to worry about in this area. The only thing that's even a little dangerous in these parts is a mountain lion, and that we had a better chance of being simultaneously struck by lightning and bitten by a shark than we had of a lion attacking a person and a half. She's tiny, dumb joke. She tells me she knows all of this stuff, but this is different. She insists she can sense danger and that we need to go now. What a strange girl. I could sense her genuine fear, so I didn't try to convince her of how irrational she was acting, and I decided to lead her back to camp. She relaxed for about 10 minutes, then was right back to her happy, extroverted self. She directed me to sit in a chair where I was facing the fire, with the thickest of the woods directly in my line of sight behind that. She brought out an old CD player and hit play. Alleluia by Leonard Cohen started playing, as she walked behind the fire and started dancing seductively. Not trash stripper seductive, but slow, classy, fluid movements. She was casting a 40 foot shadow on the wall of trees behind her. So what I was seeing was a bonfire, beautiful F dancing directly behind the flames that were licking the night sky, and behind that, a massive 40 foot giant shadow imitating her every move. 
combined with it being the first time I'd ever heard the Leonard Cohen song and the overall ambience, I was transported to another world. It was surreal, beautiful. I think this is when I fell in love, but still. What a strange girl. I was speechless after her performance. I didn't compliment her because there weren't words to express how moved I was. I think the look on my face gave away how blown away I was. She laughed, kissed me on my forehead, and finally went and changed into camp clothes. We sat talking as the fire cracked rhythmically, which kept me in a mildly euphoric state. Then there was another loud and obvious snap off in the woods. She had a flashlight in her hand and directed the beam into the forest. I was actually a little surprised when she caught a set of glowing eyes, just staring at us. In a whisper, she asked me what it is. I laugh and tell her that it's probably a raccoon, but it could be literally dozens of things. But the one thing I'm positive of is that it's not dangerous. She bluntly tells me that I'm wrong and that we are absolutely in danger. What a strange girl. As I do every time camping, I sit by the fire with a pocket knife and a piece of wood trying to whittle some sort of sculpture. I've done this at least a hundred times and nothing has ever come out of it except maybe the thing that kind of sort of resembled a spoon that one time. Every time there was a noise in the bush, F snapped the flashlight beam in its direction. About half the time she was catching glowing eyes and she was on edge. I was going overboard expressing that it was nothing, which relaxed her a bit but it was obvious that she trusted her instincts a little more than my confidence. More snaps in the bush. This time the flashlight beam picked up multiple sets of eyes. Hmm, odd. This makes me near positive it's raccoons. Over the next hour, F's vigilance on the flashlight would have made World War II plain spotters jealous. As our fire dies almost completely out and we're encompassed by the pitch black of night, it is obvious that whatever family of little critters that's off in the woods has taken quite an interest on us. There are sets of eyes that have us half surrounded for at least 180 degrees. When F used to tell this story, there were dozens of eyes. I can't confirm that because honestly I wasn't that interested in it. I'm personally sure it was at least 7 or 8 sets of eyes that I saw from how completely we were surrounded, but like I said, I wasn't really paying attention. F swears it was dozens, she's 100% on this. I don't really have any reason not to believe her, because she was the one super tuned in to what was happening. The fire goes completely out. F does another sweep with the light. The glowing eyes are right smack up on the perimeter of the oak tree wall next to our camp. For the first time, I'm a tiny bit unnerved. Another sound, she clicks on the light. What she saw. Not five feet from where M, me, is sitting is a large wolf, head down to the ground, butt in the air in an obvious pounce position. Its teeth were bared and nose wrinkled in a snarl. What I saw, the same thing. I saw the same thing, minus the teeth. The exact same thing. My logical brain knows that there's no wolves in that area and hasn't been for a very long time. What was sitting there, coiled ready to smoke me, had the biggest coyote I've ever seen. In SoCal, these are typically skinny, unhealthy, fearful animals. This one was massive, had a full coat and was 100% creeping on me. I've spent so many hundreds of hours in the wilderness and I've never seen anything like it. Everyone who knows me and F knows this is a true story. But people that don't know us don't believe us. I don't blame them. It's so far removed from typical coyote characteristics that I can't even begin to explain it. But I swear on everything that it's true. So the wolf coyote thing is ready to pounce and in a moment that F isn't proud of, she drops the light and screams a blood curdling scream that would have secured her as a B-movie horror actress for a generation. The light blinks out as it hits the ground and I pop from my chair blindly holding my little pocket knife in front of me. It only took a second or two to realise the coyote wasn't going to attack because it literally almost on me. The attack would have happened already. I pick the light off the ground and give it some taps and it comes to life. No wolf, no coyote, no glowing eyes. I think F scream scared them back to Wyoming. E and K pop out of the car and tent 
and people from other com campsites come running up. We tell the story a few times as new people keep arriving to see what the fuss was about. F insists it was wolves. It couldn't have been, but it's not a fight I'm going to take after she was right about everything else. K is scared to death. She pulls my buddy E into her tent to keep her safe. F and I calm down enough to crawl into a tent. About 30 minutes later, there's a 5.6 magnitude earthquake. She looks me in the eyes and quite seriously says, we made that happen. What a strange girl. In loving memory of FFG. I miss you. You always told this thing better than me. The rain pelted my back as I hurriedly walked up to my school. Thunder clapped in the distance as I finally walked into the vestibule with the lights flickering. Chatter filled the halls as I made my way towards my locker. My name's Jackson. I'm a sophomore at Ridgewood High School. My school isn't huge, but it isn't small either. Everyone knows each other, but we're not all friends, if that makes any sense. I noticed a short girl at the locker next to mine. That locker had always been empty. A new student, perhaps? Or did someone's locker get switched? As I got closer, I realised that I've never seen this girl before. She was short and thin, with long hair tangled, cascading down her back. She wore a chestnut brown oversized hoodie, black leggings and black boots. Hi, are you new here? I don't think we've met before, I said with a smile. Yeah, my name's Beverly, she said while trying to open the locker. Her fingernails caked in dirt had caught my attention, but I kept my thoughts to myself, as I knew better than to comment on looks. You know where room 203 is? she asked. Yeah, actually, that's where I was about to head. Biology first period with Mr. Grant? She nodded her head slowly. I took a better look at her. Her face was fully covered in makeup. Her hazel eyes had a yellowish tint to them, and her lips were extremely chapped. Perhaps she comes from a poor family. I showed her the way to our first class of the day, and we discussed her schedule, which to my amazement was very similar than mine. As we took our seats, class began at the sound of the bell. Almost halfway through the period, I had noticed something. Beverly seemed to have not been acknowledged by everyone, anyone but me this entire time. Even the teachers had not seemed to notice her existence. Maybe I was just looking into it too deeply, but something felt off. Must be the weather, I suppose. Beverly and I shared the same lunch period, so I offered to sit with her at lunch, to which she accepted. I wasn't popular at school, but I wasn't a nobody either. I knew people, and people knew me. I didn't really have any friends either, as the ones I did have either had different lunch periods or weren't in school today. If you don't mind me asking, where do you live? I asked as I took a bite of my ham sandwich. She took a second to respond, but eventually said, I live at the corner of Maple and Greenstone. I tried to think of that area, but I wasn't too familiar with the streets north of the school. We had a project for English, and we decided to be partners. Did you want to come to my place to work on the project at the school? I live right down the road. I can't, she said quickly and looked away. Could we go to a park, maybe? Her response confused me, but I agreed, and our plans were made. The bell rang at two o'clock and she followed me out the doors into the drizzling rain. Are you sure you don't want to come to my place, or even to your place? It's a bit wet outside, I asked. No, we agreed on the park, Beverly said firmly. For winter in New York, the weather was fairly comfortable, at 45 degrees. The park benches squeaked as we both sat down. I put down my sweatshirt on top of the table to prevent our papers from getting wet. I looked over to Beverly and saw her covering up her face with even more makeup. You know, you don't need that much makeup, I joked. She stared at me with narrowed eyes and continued applying a skin-coloured liquid to her face. Eventually, we got to work on our project. It consisted of me doing all the work while she fidgeted and stared off into space. It didn't bother me much because I was used to always doing all the work for group projects, but I was hoping to get to know more about her. Before I knew it, the little bit of sun that was out had set, leaving us, or rather myself, working under the light of a dim streetlight. I think this is good for today, I said while packing my notebooks into my backpack. 
She nodded her head and picked up her worn out backpack. It, bought, it caught my attention that she didn't even have any books or anything in her bag at all. I get it, first day at new school and all, but she didn't eat or drink anything with me the majority of the day either. I can walk you home if you'd like, I smiled. No, you can't, she said with a stern look on her face. Are you sure? It's dark out and I want to make sure you get home okay. No, I'll walk home by myself. I assumed she was just being safe, considering she barely knew me and she only met me today. Fair enough, I suppose. I'm practically a stranger to her. We said our goodbyes and headed in opposite directions. As I began walking, curiosity had gotten the best of me. I wanted to know where she lived, but also wanted to make sure she got home safe since there has been an increase in crime in the area lately. I kept my distance from her and followed her for about 15 minutes taking multiple turns through an area I was completely unfamiliar with. I checked my phone, and luckily I had enough battery to use the map app to find my way home. Wait, Beverly didn't use her phone today. I never saw her with one, and it didn't seem like she brought it with her. Maybe her family couldn't afford one. Still, even now in 2021, it was odd for one to not have some type of smartphone. Maybe I never saw her use it. Beverly started running, and that caught my attention. I picked up the pace while also keeping my footsteps light so she wouldn't hear me. She slowed down under a street lamp, looked around her with watchful eyes. I ducked behind a tree so she wouldn't catch me. I took this time to take in the area around me. Right in front of where she stood was a cemetery I had never seen in my 16 years of life. She quickly hopped the fence and made her way down the dirt path. I followed her, being sure to avoid sticks and puddles that may make a sound. I had accidentally lost track of her in the darkness. Surprisingly, there were no lights in the cemetery at all, which made it even more spooky. Just then, I saw a figure kneeling down in front of a grave, digging in the dirt. What the f- I whispered to myself. As I got closer, the figure was no longer there. Was my mind playing tricks on me? Where had Beverly gone? I was curious as to what that figure was doing in front of that grave, so I slowly made my way towards it. It was a fairly normal grave. Mother Nature had weathered down the gravestone a bit, and vines cuddled it. The dirt appeared completely untouched, which made me feel even more uneasy than I already was. My heart nearly stopped as I read the name engraved into the stone. Our beloved daughter, Beverly M. Keating, 2005 to 2021. You are always in our hearts and thoughts. You were taken from us far too soon. We love you always. I took a step back, almost tripping on a gravestone behind me. My eyes caught a glimpse of a picture frame nestled in the dirt in front of the grave. It was a picture of an older man, woman, a young girl and a baby boy. The young girl looked like a younger version of Beverly. I couldn't believe what I was seeing right now. This must be a dream. Beverly spent almost the whole day with me. She talked to me. Beverly? I called out to the night. Only the crickets and the whistling of the wind responded. The air got even colder, so I turned to head home. Just as I turned around, a faint whisper from behind me. I told you not to take me home. So, this happened roughly two years ago. I worked at a hotel, which had 50 rooms between three floors. I was the only employee in the building after about 5 p.m. It should be noted, I'm a girl. The hotel is on the farther side of the city, but it's considered to be on the nicer side. So, a lot of companies will send their workers to us for room and board, instead of the shadier motels on the opposite side of the city. Some of them were great guests, others completely trashed everything. But that happens everywhere, I suppose. The layout of the building was pretty simple. You pull up to the front entrance, enter the foyer, and the front desk lobby is right through a set of automatic doors. Right across the hall from the lobby was a staircase leading up to the second floor, and to the left was our elevators to the second and third floor. The first floor only has rooms on one side to compensate for our pool, workout room, and breakfast area slash dining room. Lobby and the office rooms all being on the opposite side. 
The upper floors have rooms on each side, with the third floor having the most rooms. Typically, the third floor, the highest, were kept only for business and long stays. The second floor was reserved for short stays or bigger parties, and the first floor we kept open for elders who have wheelchairs or walkers, or people who might come in late at night for a one night stay. I promise, this is relevant to the story. Anyway, I was getting towards the last few hours of my shift. It was slow that night, aside from a few work groups I'd checked in a few hours earlier. I noticed a raggedy, rusted and beat up black pickup truck pulling into the brightly lit carpet. So I got my paperwork ready for checking. A guy gets out, completely covered in dirt. I figured he just got off work, as most guys come in covered in dirt or oil. I do specifically remember that he reeked, which isn't too out of the norm either. Entirely, I just chalked up to him being an oil field or construction worker. I got his credentials, his name was Michael, and scanned it into the computer. He also was reluctant to leave his vehicle information with me, but I explained if he didn't, the vehicle was at risk of being towed by morning. I thought he caved just because he was only going to be here for the night. Michael requested a second floor room close to the lobby staircase so we could have easy access to the front doors for smoking. Not out of the norm either. After taking his payment, I set up his room keys. I explained parking, policies, and explained how he can get to his room, which was right up the staircase and the door was on the opposite wall. He had a few bags with him and he went upstairs. Almost immediately, he comes back down the stairs and accuses me of giving him broken room keys. I had to explain if he put them next to his phone or anywhere near a magnet, potentially in his wallet, the keys will deactivate. I did offer to take him upstairs and open the room for him to make sure the new set of keys worked, and they did. He walked into his room by himself, shut the door, so with that, I was on my way back down to the lobby. When I got back in the office, Something odd caught my eye on the cameras. He hadn't left the building, but his car wasn't in front anymore. He didn't mention about having another person with him. If there was, we were supposed to charge a $10 fee per extra person. The side doors didn't open unless you have a room key or are on the inside of the hotel. So I started to watch the cameras to make sure he wasn't trying to sneak people in. About 20 minutes pass, and I notice nothing happening except him coming down the stairs. I smile politely, and he goes outside. He stays outside for about 10 minutes, just standing in the carport. I can see it on camera. Now, while I thought that was a little weird, I just chalked it up to him taking a smoke. I stopped paying attention after a while, and started to find my paperwork that was due before my shift ended. Michael ran back into the hotel, cigarette still in his mouth. I instructed him he must take a cigarette outside and put it out. I told him prior we do not allow smoking in the building. He just threw it on the ground and put it out with his shoe. He turned his attention towards the TV and ended up sitting in the lobby for an ungodly amount of time. He kept glancing towards the door, which made me uncomfortable. During this time, the friendly demeanor he had at check-in completely disappeared. He seemed paranoid and agitated now. He would whisper to himself, but I couldn't hear what. After about 30 minutes of him doing this, I instructed him to go back up to his room because I cannot have people in the lobby when I'm working on closing procedures. It was a lie, it was a lie, but ownership allows us to make up reasons if we are comfortable with a guest's presence. Michael asked me to take him up to his room because he is uncomfortable and scared. I explained that I'm unable to do that for safety reasons. What I could do was watch him go up the stairs on camera and he could call down to the office on his room phone when he arrived into his room. I was just trying to be friendly and get him upstairs as quick as I could. He goes upstairs but immediately comes back down and informs me that he forgot where his room was and I would need to show him. I told him I can't leave the office or lobby but I can explain it to him where his room is because it was super simple. He was continuing his whispers. This time it was about losing his phone. I didn't pay any mind to it. After explaining to Michael where his room was, he went back, back upstairs and I heard the door slam shut. It echoed through the second and first floors and it gave me chills for some reason. Almost immediately, he comes back down and starts yelling at me, telling me I stole his cell phone 
I'm planning his demise and I need to find his phone. This was completely bogus as I haven't left the office since making sure his room key worked. He asked me for help and I just wanted him to go away. So I slipped a screwdriver in my pocket just in case he tried to attack me and I began rummaging through the lobby couches looking for his phone. I didn't find it but I did find his credit card which he also began accusing me of stealing. I stood my ground and said if he can't respect me in my place of work I can call the police and request they escort him into his room or off the facility. He got angrier, snatched his card from my hands and went back inside. After about 20 minutes he comes back inside. He's calmer but he asks if he would please go outside with him because there's something wrong with his car. After I absolutely refuse, he tells me that I need to go outside. That it's not fair he's the only person out there working on his car and he just needs some fucking help. I had to explain that I'm not allowed to accompany a guest outside of the building. He just starts repeating that I absolutely have to go outside with him. Now, I have anxiety and I tend to let my mind roam over wide horizons and this was no difference. I was about to have a panic attack so I called the owners and asked them what I should do. It was my first hotel job and although I have tons of freedom doing my job I still want to know how to properly handle these situations. The owner told me that if I am uncomfortable and suspect he's under the influence or a danger to myself or himself I have full reign to call the police, have them ban him from the property. I asked if they could just keep an eye on the cameras they have access to at home because he's acting weird. I locked all the lobby doors and made sure the side and fire exits were all properly secured and closed so no one could sneak in. I did this while doing this on the phone with my boss because I was scared to leave the office by myself. I forget, after getting back behind the office, I locked the door and I just braced for him to come back inside. My boss tells me to just watch the cameras and keep my cell phone nearby just in case I have to call for help. Meanwhile, I noticed on the cameras, I couldn't see Michael anymore. I didn't know where he parked, but I damn sure wasn't going to go looking. But what I did notice, there was another vehicle driving through our parking lot. I called the hotel next door to, to ask if the car was on their cameras too. And I was informed it was an unknown vehicle to their records. It was unknown to mine as well. They just That just shot my anxiety up even higher. The car would have drive around the back of the building to the front but avoid the carport turn and then do the same to the building next door the parking lot was almost empty so i know they weren't looking for a parking spot the car keeps going and i'm watching it on camera so focused that i didn't notice michael come back inside telling michael he either needs to go up to his room or vacate the premises he just continues to yell at me saying i need to go outside with him he won't move out from in front of the entrance. I imagine he was staying within view of whoever else he kept looking back at. Then randomly, I see him sprint across the parking lot and out of the camera view. I also didn't see the camera anymore after that. Since it was practically the end of my shift, I somehow managed to get everything done just in time for the next shift to arrive. I was so glad to see her, I almost cried. I explained to her what happened and that the owners wanted her to keep the lobby doors closed. We put up signs explaining our doors were broken and due to safety reasons, guests have to call for entry or use the side entrances for their room. I also deactivated Michael's room keys and told the next shift girl not to let him back. If he shows up, to call the police because he's a security risk. I made sure she watched me get into my Uber ride after triple checking the vehicle and driver matched what my phone said. Since I was a regular customer of the driver, he asked why I was so riled up. I asked him to drive through the parking lot with doors closed so I could see if Michael's truck or the other vehicle I saw driving across the parking lot were anywhere near the buildings. And they weren't. I have no idea what happened to them. The next day I had my boyfriend come stay the entire evening shift with me just in case he came back because I was told by my bosses that he never came to get his stuff. He wouldn't pick up the phone for calls either. Nothing happened that night, or any other night, except a month later. Michael came in asking about his stuff, and if he could get a room. I refused his room, and luckily other people were with me in the lobby and in the office. 
I had our maintenance guy go and retrieve his items and explained he is no longer allowed on the property. If we saw him, the police would be called and he would be arrested for trespassing. Again, this wasn't true, but we didn't want him coming back at all. I noticed Michael had a different vehicle this time. It was a newer model SUV, and it was maroon. It matched neither his beat up black up pickup truck or the dark colored sedan I saw driving in circles. If there was anything that sat with me even after all this time, it was that he remembered my name. He addressed me by my name when he walked up to the counter, and at first I thought, oh yeah, my name is a part of my uniform, until I realized I forgot to put on my name tag that day. After that, I refused to wear one in the hotel. Management let me create a fake name and wear that from point on. It took me a while to feel safe in the building again while I was alone. I constantly had my boyfriend with me while I worked the evening shift. There is a chance the guy and the circling vehicle are unrelated, but my anxiety and the aura I got from Michael that night, it didn't feel good or right. So, Michael, let's not meet ever again. TLDR, creepy dirty hotel guest tries to get me to go outside with him for many different reasons. When I refused and he left again, another vehicle began to circle the parking lot over and over. Each time he came back inside, he kept looking outside the doors, acting real agitated and paranoid. After standing my ground and refusing to go outside, he left. He didn't come back until a month later and he remembered my name and I wasn't wearing a name tag. Scared me so badly, I didn't stay in my building myself for a long time.